we have seen so far how milton made us witness what you can call the universe's first therapy session adam freshly minted also curious sits in front of raphael who is sent by god to curb his curiosity share his wisdom and at the same time make sure that the first created human doesn't go astray so let's find out today what else is adam curious about we will find out also what he has to say about his origin and about his feelings towards eve what we'll find out today is milton's exploration of man's thirst for knowledge and the first stirrings of love's confusion and will perhaps make us all think why a little ignorance is sometimes a bliss so watch closely till the end as we go through the most important points in what you have to keep in mind is that in book 7 we had seen how the feminine energy creativity is explored and glorified but here in book 8 we will see how female subordination is reinforced so it begins like this that adam is full of gratitude and yet his curiosity is not over he is still speaking to raphael and uh, he begins to question about the vastness of the universe and apparent smallness of earth he compares this earth to a mere speck of grain because he can witness the uh, great number of stars and planets all around him and he is confused confused about what his purpose is confused about what the purpose of these celestial bodies is now from the point of view of adam the main purpose of the heavenly bodies like stars and all is to move around the earth because he observes from his point uh, that earth is fixed and these bodies are moving around the earth and that is the way the bible looks at the universe and he feels confused that why are these big things huge things moving around the earth what is so special about earth now while he is uh, speaking out uh, these confusions of his mind what is happening with eve eve leaves quietly uh, to tend to her garden and it is shown as if she doesn't want to be a part of this you know, intellectual exchange of ideas and she prefers to hear uh, everything from adam as if adam is the interpreter of the world for eve and let's look at these lines yet when she not as not with such discourse delighted or not capable her ear of what was high so milton is telling us that it's not that she is not capable of understanding what raphael was explaining but why did she go away such pleasure she reserved adam relating she soul auditress so auditress means somebody who listens and um, adam relating means adam interpreting to her whatever raphael has told adam so this situation is preferred by eve where adam will be explaining to her whatever is told to adam but remember milton has said that this is not her compulsion it is not that she is not capable of understanding raphael's words it is her choice so we see independence and choice already in eve and she prefers to be only in the company of adam Raphael he responds to Adam and uh, he says yes uh, it's okay for you to ask these questions and he says that this is beyond your comprehension so this is like a teacher of high school speaking to a primary school student that this is not in your syllabus okay you can be filled with wonder and awe uh, but you cannot be considered capable enough of understanding the intricacies of what is happening in the world why are the planets moving around and uh, why is the earth uh, the center so he avoids answering um, the questions that adam is raising here and he says focus only on what is necessary for your existence and happiness and he asks him to be humble 
that this is beyond your grasp this is god's area of expertise and you will not have the ability to understand these things and somehow it is felt that rafael is saying human understanding is limited and he says you should be lowly wise so wisdom is fine but you should have humility along with wisdom adam seems to be reassured that okay fine i will not be asking these questions and uh, he also thinks that it's important to focus on practical immediate knowledge than uh, thinking about these abstract ideas and then he begins to talk about his own experience his own idea about what is going on in paradise how is he feeling about it and rafael says that please continue you tell me about your experience so adam speaks to rafael and this time he talks about his birth and eve's origin and all so when he is telling about his first day in eden he says how he awakes and uh, he feels refreshed and filled with wonder um, and he observes the sky the landscape the living creatures around him uh, and somehow he has this confusion about himself that who am i what am i supposed to do here and who created him and then he says myself i then perused so he first looked at everything else and then he looked at himself and limb by limb surveyed and sometimes went and sometimes ran with supple joints as lively vigor led but who i was or where or from what cause knew not to speak i tried and then he started to speak and the interesting thing is that usually a child learns to speak listening to the parents or the people who take care of it but here adam does not have a predecessor he doesn't have somebody to copy but he is capable of speech so it is as if speech language all these things are also given to him by god and not acquired uh, like we know from the theories of evolution that we have acquired these qualities here bible is granting adam an exact moment of achievement that i can speak and he can begin speaking and what does he say my tongue obeyed and readily could name what or i saw so the first thing this is very natural even with children when they first begin to speak they speak uh, words which are mostly nouns okay because they understand objects they don't understand feelings emotions yet hunger they understand but uh, they cannot articulate those things which are abstract same goes with adam he is looking at different kinds of things and creatures and is naming them thou sun said i fair light and thou enlightened earth so fresh and gay so he names the sun the earth and he hills and dales he rivers wood and plains and he that live and move fair creatures tell tell if he saw how came i thus how here so he first names things and then he asks those things like he is asking the animals he is asking the river he is asking the earth do you know from where i have come but these creatures or objects they do not have the capability of speech so obviously his curiosity is not resolved but he realizes that he has not come from some void somebody has created him so not of myself by some great maker then in goodness and in power preeminent tell me how may i know him how adore so from the beginning it is seen that adam is filled with loyalty and gratitude for somebody who has created him and then he uh, sits down in contemplation falls asleep and then he has a dream in the dream he is given certain replies so what milton is doing is that he's trying to make it as plausible as possible uh, or as scientifically probable as possible uh, that 
your answers are there in your mind and when we are sleeping uh, those answers surface and we can see into the life of things so in the dream a divine figure later it is revealed that it is god appears and guides adam to the garden of eden and then like he was not there in eden at first he just woke up on earth and he was led to eden introduced to that place and then he was given that instruction that you can be free here do whatever you want but do not eat from that tree of knowledge so how does he get that instruction fear here no dearth dearth means shortage you should never fear that the trees will not bear fruit so you will always have food fear here no dearth but of the tree the warning but of the tree whose operation brings knowledge of good and ill which i have set the pledge of thy obedience and thy faith so it's like a test i have put it there to test you remember what i warned thee shun to taste stop yourself from tasting shun means stop and shun the bitter consequence if you can stop yourself from tasting then you can also prevent the result or the consequence for no the day thou eatest thereof my soul command transgressed inevitably thou shalt die so the warning is if you eat that you will die that's like poison from that day mortal and this happy state shalt lose now the interesting thing is that god is not saying that you will immediately die he says that you will become mortal that means subject to death expelled from hence into a world of woe and sorrow so that was a scary warning he received but you know somehow i feel that adam was like a child and if you tell a child that don't do this then the child wants to do exactly that so this fascination for abomination or this desire for the forbidden this is all very deeply ingrained in human mind and uh, logically if god has made human mind it is not entirely man's responsibility that he feels so tempted then god grants adam dominion over everything that you will be ruling over everybody and uh, you name them naming is an important thing because when we get a pet for ourselves the first thing we do is we name them and naming kind of bonds us to the creature and we get a sense of being the superior the master and the controller because when you name something that means you are providing an identity to it and a provider of identity is like the master so adam names each animal understanding their natures uh, but he still feels incomplete there's something wrong with this universe he desires for companionship and he says in solitude what happiness who can enjoy alone or all enjoying what contentment find so he thinks that at the end of the day if i am surrounded with my subordinates the animals are his subordinates maybe i can still enjoy but i won't find peace i won't find contentment so this is like his first experience of life and then adam asks god that i'm so lonely how can i be happy and god explains that his uh, desire for companionship is natural but he asks a very important question here he asks adam what thinkest thou then of me what about me god is asking this to adam what thinkest thou then of me and this my state seem i to thee sufficiently possessed of happiness or not don't you think i'm happy now who will say that god is not happy who am alone from all eternity for none i know second to me or like equal much less so there is nobody second to god 
there is nobody equal to god so if god can be happy why can't adam be happy so god is equating his situation with adam's situation and he continues to say how have i then with whom to hold converse save with the creatures which i made so whenever i feel the need to talk i talk with creatures whom i have made for instance i'm speaking to you now this is what god's version is and those to me inferior in finite descents beneath what other creatures are to thee so he is equating his situation with adam's situation but adam is very intelligent he says thou in thyself art perfect and in thee there is no deficiency found not so is man man is deficient man has problems weaknesses but in degree the cause of his desire by conversation with his like to help or solace his defects so since man has defects he needs to talk to other people with their defects and by talking by mutual understanding man can evolve so while milton is talking about a biblical thing here he is not altogether unaware of the idea of evolution evolving into a better spirit and how does man do that through socializing no need that thou shouldst propagate already infinite now he says that you are god you are infinite you don't need another god because you are unlimited but i am limited and i need to have reproduction of myself because i am not infinite and through all numbers absolute though one but man by number is to manifest his single imperfection and beget like of his like his image multiplied so man needs to multiply in unity defective which requires collateral love and dearest amity so man is defective so man needs to have lots of men so that their mutual amity friendship companionship can win over their defects that is not the case with god because god does not have by default any defect in short he wants somebody to be with him so god puts adam to sleep and then he takes a rib from his side and obviously there is a wound but after the entire procedure god closes the wound so it's like a surgery in biblical terms now this rib is used to create eve why does god need a rib to create eve this can be an interesting question which milton does not talk about you might have this question in your mind that if he created adam uh, out of certain non human materials why does he need eve to be created from a human material that is the rib was god feeling a bit lazy was he in a rush or did he want to from the very beginning establish the superiority of adam he is made to be the source of eve's sustenance adam's reaction to eve after eve is made obviously he really loves what he sees and he sees her as his perfect partner and he describes now everything that we have here is adam's version as he is speaking to raphael so he says on she came led by her heavenly maker though unseen so the maker was unseen but adam felt as if god was guiding eve and guided by his voice nor uninformed of nuptial sanctity and marriage rites so it's god's voice who had directed eve that this is your job this is your responsibility and she was given complete instructions grace was in all her steps heaven in her eye in every gesture dignity and love i overjoyed could not forbear aloud so he feels overwhelmed by love and he realizes that this is going to be my partner and then he says woman is her name so 
who gives the word woman adam the same way he makes up the word tiger sun earth so he has given the opportunity to name the woman as the woman and i have already told you what happens when someone has the authority to name another person or a creature it establishes the rule woman is her name of man extracted for this cause he shall forgo father and mother and to his wife adhere and they shall be one flesh one heart one soul in any case they do not have parents they have each other so then what happens they move towards their new home their, their nuptial bower their marriage spot to the nuptial bower i led her blushing like the morn now why was he blushing because she was shy coy but then wasn't she supposed to be innocent and if somebody is innocent and she is like just born like a child then why should there be shyness coyness in her all heaven and happy constellations on that hour shed their selectest influence the earth gave sign of gratulation and each hill joyous the birds fresh gales and gentle airs whispered it to the woods and from their wings flung rose flung odors from the spicy shrub disporting till the amorous bird of night sung spousal so the entire natural world was celebrating the union of adam and eve and bid haste the evening star on his hill top to light the bridal lamp beautiful expression and uh, this is almost a spencerian charm about it it's like i'm reading a passage from some love sonnet by spencer isn't it so this is the renaissance in milton speaking and then adam reflects on how eve had affected him he feels that she was the center of his thoughts um, he ignored everything else and somehow he felt that he was overpowered by her beauty and she is like less perfect in reason and authority this is what adam says but he feels that her other qualities her practical wisdom and everything compensates for her lack of intellectual um a superiority which adam has over her now he says this or nature failed in me and left some part not proof enough such object to sustain so he feels that eve was created out of his body so while eve was created maybe a little portion of adam was taken away from him so he was somehow reduced from what he was before he was created from my side subducting it's like subtracting took perhaps more than enough maybe god took more than what he should have at least on her bestowed too much of ornament in outward show elaborate of inward less exact so outward show in eve was more glorious she was more beautiful than adam was and adam thinks this is because a bigger chunk was taken from out of his body than was necessary but he also says that her inward qualities were inferior to adam and then he says yet when i approach her loveliness so absolute she seems and in herself complete but although she is less qualified when you think about intellect when i approach her it appears that she is sufficient enough complete so well to know her own that what she wills to do or say seems wisest virtuousest 
discreetest, best. And he feels that uh, whatever she says, whatever she wants to do, appears to me to be the best option. So it's like he is controlled by her beauty, her charm, and he feels a little subdued. Now, Raphael is not happy about it. And he says, do not blame nature or do not doubt wisdom. He suggests that do not be swayed by external beauty. For what admirest thou, what you are admiring now, what transports thee so an outside? Fair, no doubt. And worthy well thy cherishing, it's okay to fall in love with somebody's appearance, thy honouring and thy love, not thy subjection. So he says that it's okay to love her, to admire her, but do not be controlled by her, do not be her subject. Weigh with her thyself, calculate who is more wise, who is more qualified. So he's asking Adam to compare himself with Eve. Then value. Of times, nothing profits more than self-esteem. He wants Adam to be proud of himself. Now, like moments earlier, he was saying humility should be there in you. And now he's saying you should have self-esteem. The point is, he wants Adam to be humble to God. He wants Adam to be humble to angels. But he doesn't want Adam to be humble to a woman. Talk about double standards. Okay. Grounded on just and right, well managed. Of that skill, the more thou knowest. So you are more capable of justice, uh, wisdom, to know what is right. And the more you will... Assert your self-esteem, the more she will acknowledge thee her head and to realities yield all her shows. You represent practical knowledge, you represent real knowledge. She is just an illusion, only an appearance and she will submit to you if you know how to hold your ground. The counselling session is still going strong. And then he says, Love refines the thoughts and heart enlarges, hath his seat in reason and is judicious, is the scale by which to heavenly love thou mayst ascend. So, it is a way in which you can understand how to love God. So, love is a very positive thing. This is what Raphael is saying. Not sunk in carnal pleasure. Do not associate it with physicality. That means what? Carnal pleasure was there even before the fall. And Adam was kind of brainwashed out of it that this is not right. Do not think about desire. Desire is sinful. Among the beasts, no mate for thee was found. If God wanted you to have carnal pleasure, he would get a beast for you. He made a man for you, like a woman is also a man, human. Why? Because God wants you to experience the higher love. Adam is replying to the angel and saying that uh, it's not Eve's appearance only. And it's not the act of procreation or the physical element of their relationship that makes him feel like this. He is saying that he is captivated by her actions. Now that is something very nice, isn't it? Like he's saying, I am not in love with just her beauty. I am in love with her behavior, her grace, her genuineness, her decency. And he's attracted towards that and what's harm in there. And he says, I'm not led astray by my senses. And he chooses to follow what he believes is right. And he thinks that, yes, love is a path to heaven. And he wants to know, what about angels? Do angels have this kind of love for each other or for anything at all? Now, what does Raphael say? Because he cannot say that I cannot explain to you. He cannot say that uh, it is beyond my knowledge because Adam is now asking about Raphael's own situation. And he says, like Adam says, 
Bear with me then, he is asking Raphael. If lawful what I ask, love not the heavenly spirits? And how their love express they? By looks only? Or do they mix irradiance, virtual or immediate touch? Touch. Physicality. So he is saying to the angel that what about the love of angels? Do you love each other only by your looks? You, how do you show your love? Only by looking at each other? Or just mixing your elements, touching? An angel is quite uncomfortable here. He smiles and he says that, of course, we know how to love. Because without love, there cannot be any happiness. But he also says that we do not have any uh, physical barriers. What is touch? Think about it. When you touch another person, you're actually reinforcing the idea that the two bodies are different. There is a skin, or rather two layers of skins, separating the two entities. But when two angels love, there is nothing to stop them from complete union. They get fused into each other like salt and water. And it is effortless. It doesn't have limitations of union and it's complete blending. Whatever pure thou in the body enjoyest and pure thou wert created, we enjoy in eminence. So yes, Adam and Eve, they are created pure and they enjoy a pure love. But angels enjoy even a higher level of pure love because they do not have bodies which create boundaries. Bodies are boundaries. They are kind of trapping your soul, your spirit. Easier than air with air, if spirits embrace, total they mix. Union of pure with pure, desiring, nor restrained conveyance need as flesh to mix with flesh or soul with soul, but I can now no more. Raphael is clearly not comfortable talking about the union of angels. Neither is Milton, I guess. So he departs after giving his final advice and he says that the sun is about to set. Let me just leave. And he cautions Adam once more uh, and he wants him to remember that his choices will affect his descendants. And he says, take heed, be warned, lest passion sway. Don't let passion control you. Thy judgment to do aught which else free will would not admit. Judgment versus free will. So Milton keeps on exploring the idea of how free man's will was, how much choice he did have. And here Raphael is asking Adam to prioritize judgment over free will, which else free will would not admit. Thine and of all thy sons, the wheel or woe in thee is placed. It is your responsibility. In you we have placed the responsibility of your future generations. Beware. I, in thy persevering, shall rejoice. If you persevere, if you stick to what is right, if you listen to me, then I will rejoice. I will be happy. And all the blessed. Stand fast. To stand or fall, free in thine own arbitrament it lies. It is in your hands to fall or not to fall. The angel departs for heaven and Adam returns to his bower reflecting on the advice given. What happens next is history. History? Well, if you think Bible is history, then it's history. If you think Bible is fictional, then it's a beautiful episode in that fiction. I leave that to you to decide for yourself how you look at this beautiful story. For me, everything is literature. So I leave you today. We'll meet very soon with another episode. And this series is about to be over very, very soon. I hope you're enjoying this. So please share with your friends and stay subscribed. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off. Bye-bye.